And welcome back to Mixed Media Live. This is episode 33. We've done a lot of these at this point. I think we're uh, somewhat veterans. Um, it's been interesting to see how this has been going, seeing the reception as time has gone on. Um, but before we continue with our awesome program for today, uh, let's introduce ourselves. So my name is Irving Nestor. I'm a filmmaker and media entrepreneur. I own a company called Ariella. Uh, you can see my website at ariella.co. Hey, I'm, I'm uh, Nathan. I'm a uh, video game developer and a 3D model. And I'm Ben Costello. I'm a flute player and a media composer. Yeah, and we're mixed media. So every week we're here Fridays at 7 p.m. talking about all things art and media, whether it's stuff that's in the news, whether it's philosophy, whether it's reviews on something particular, or whatever we want to talk about. In fact, we invite people on for interviews a lot of times. And one thing I want to shout out is that we're new to Rumble. So this is our second stream on Rumble. And shout out to Rob Sharma again for essentially sponsoring our ability to be on Rumble. Shout out to him and you can help us out by going to mixmedia.locals.com there you can support us for five dollars a month this on the right side of the screen is actually a live whiteboard that is free for you to draw on and have fun with and troll us with or whatever the heck you want to do with if you support us there um, along with a whole bunch of other perks including um, getting in front of the line in the queue for reviewing your work whatever work that you do if we can review it of course Subject to restrictions, blah, 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 blah. So we've got a pretty jam-packed day. Um, actually, first, is there anything uh, special in your guys' weeks and all that? Um, not really. It's been pounded with work, but <laughs> other than that, pretty uh, pretty normal. Yeah, yeah, I haven't done that much. I, I've been trying to do some um, networking with some other you know, uh, young, aspiring uh, comp local composers, but you know, not, not too much other than that. Yeah, networking is good. Yeah, so this is a thing that I want to cover because it's been making headlines. I've read a bunch of articles and I feel like people are misunderstanding things from two directions. There's the film direction and then there's the firearms direction. There's like a lot of misunderstanding and a lot of it is a little bit more due to equivocation or just misunderstanding of terminology a lot of times I'll see, even by the reporters. Um, you'll see them use a, a term that's not really supposed to be used that way, et cetera, et cetera. So first, a little overview of what, what we're talking about for those who don't know. So um, there's a film called Rust, of which uh, the director of photography, the DP, another word for that is a cinematographer, uh, her name is Helena Hutchins, uh, was killed by a live round shot by Alec Baldwin on the set of Rust. So that's the big overview we're going to go to big details. But first, the goal is to respect the memory of Helena. She's a real person who died. Unfortunately, I feel like a lot of people don't treat her like a human being. Um, that's I don't think that's not specific to this particular incident, but that's often the case with like intrigue cases. Is like you, ha you find people throwing around people's names and stuff like that, you know, without care. And so I hope I don't come off that way. It's more supposed to be an informative thing. And she just recently died. So you know, I don't. I just don't want this to be interpreted as a sensational thing. Um, you know, if you pray, pray for her soul, and uh, yeah. So that that's that's the disclaimer slash my goal here. So first, with starting with Helena, who was she? So she was 42 years old. She's Ukrainian, and she was a cinematographer and journalist, uh, credited for work on. 30 plus films. I took a look at her IMDb and uh, tried to see if I recognized anything. I didn't quite recognize anything. And it was hard for me to find stuff from the stuff that she's made uh, for me to like really get an understanding of what her style would be or anything like that. So I won't be commenting on those things. But yeah, if you do know, she's done stuff called uh, like Arc Enemy, Darlin and Blind Fire. And this whole incident happened on October 21st. And it looks like her cinematography career had been particularly busy as of late, um, looking at her IMDb. Uh, she's done a ton of stuff in the last three years. So yeah, she was very busy. And she's also married and left behind a child, which hurts me. <laughs> That's who Helena is. Who, what is Rust? 
So Rust is a film, I'll read the synopsis that I think comes from IMDb, if I remember where I pulled it from. It says, a 13-year-old boy left to defend for himself and his younger brother following their parents' death in the 1880s Kansas, goes on the run with his long-estranged grandfather after he's sentenced to hang out, or sorry, sentenced to hang for the accidental killing of a local rancher. So that's the uh, synopsis, kind of an unfortunate overlap. Uh, I Yes. Yeah. And the context behind this film is that this is actually a passion project for Alec Baldwin um, and the director, uh, Joel Sousa. So they entered into this project together. Uh, I don't know what, why it's a passion project or anything like that. I have no idea. Apparently, this is something that they feel deeply about to the point where they'll make this film without a big budget. That being said, the budget was six to eight million dollars, which is you know, for a Hollywood film, that's basically nothing, right? Or like, that's pretty low. That's not nothing, but it's pretty low on the uh, totem pole, you know, a film like that, you know, and it was a crazy shoot atmosphere. They only had 21 days to shoot an entire feature film. That's absolutely insane. If you don't know, like feature films, I have that constraint. I think it's just the budget. I don't know how much, uh, People were paying themselves out. I don't know, you know, I don't know anything about the details of the breakdown or anything like that. But 21 days is really short, guys. Like, <laughs> to give you context, like, you know, you typically shoot these films if you're shooting them, if you have the privilege to shoot them completely consecutively in around three months, right? So this is less than a month. This is three weeks. So three months to three weeks is a, is a pretty in, insane uh, difference for a feature film. So, yes, very small film, tight budget, and super fast paced translation, extremely indie production. It was shot in Bonanza City, New Mexico, which is uh, near Santa Fe and Albuquerque, I believe. I'm not familiar with the geography of the area, but that's, that's what it says. <laughs> that's the backdrop. For me, I'm a filmmaker, so I, you know, I obviously don't, I'm an indie filmmaker, so I don't have like the biggest budget experience or anything like that you know i've been on sets definitely but i'm i don't have a diverse experience where i can say xyz is normal for sure from my perspective but i understand the rules of film i understand the business of film and so hopefully i can illuminate some things that have uh, that have to do with the production and the terms used and etc cetera, etc cetera. yeah the other thing is that i've i'm also i've also shot guns before that's a more recent development in my life a few times so again not uh not an expert not a firearm safety expert by all means but i have experience handling a firearm so you know there's that as well i've been following like gun youtube channels for the lulls like probably i don't know for years and years now or not following even just kind of poking around here and there so i'm familiar with the community and the culture around it as well but not as a participant is the disclaimer now for terminology this is where a lot of people have been throwing out words Without explaining, sometimes I feel like they don't explain because they're trying to associate certain things, or maybe they don't understand how to explain something, et cetera, et cetera. But it really gets to me because people are confused because I see it in the comments. I see it in uh, you know the opinion blogs and stuff like that. People get confused as to what terms mean. So the first term that we hear a lot with this incident was that Alec Baldwin was shooting a prop gun, right? So prop gun is a film term. So prop gun literally means a gun that is a prop, right? It does not mean a fake gun, which is I think what people think that means. You know, it's anything that's- Yeah, I was very confused about that. I was like, how do you kill someone with a prop gun? Because <laughs> prop, you know, yeah. So in the movie industry is, are all props things that can be, like, like doesn't mean that they can't be used, you know what I'm saying? Like if I said like a, like a uh, a prop door. Could the door be fully functional with a lock and stuff like that? You know what I'm saying? That's a great question, actually. So, yeah, what is a prop? A prop is anything under the purview of the property department or the props department. Um, prop is just short for yeah, property. I never the word prop and property. Wow. Yeah, I, I, I've never <laughs> heard that either. So Yes, the film is full of a bunch of slang, a bunch of short words and all that kind of stuff. So uh, the prop department is the property department. And the property department handles anything that someone is going to handle, right? So 
it's Does loose. Does that usage go back even further? Is that like a more recent thing that like theater has pulled in, or is that something that originates in theater? That's a good question. I'm not sure about the word prop, but I do know. Well, actually, they use the word prop in theater, so I assume there's got to be a connection. Maybe I have no idea, but uh, I know that the gun terminology in theater is completely different um, because they do use. Uh, they don't use guns that are props in uh, theater, as far as I understand. Um, well, you have a live audience. I'll, I'll go into an explanation as to why that would never make sense. But they usually, but they use like things that have ammunition, like munitions, you know, propellants and uh, explosives and stuff like that. So they use different terminology across the board about those kinds of things, is my understanding. But I'm not familiar with it. So yeah. So basically, a prop is anything that's loose. So if I can handle something, if a character ever touches something, it's a prop. So literally, if I'm an assistant director or I'm a line producer, usually what they do is they take the script and they uh, tear it down and they do what's called a breakdown. So what they do is they highlight everything that is potentially a prop. And anything that's potentially prop is something that is handled or touched by a character. So if it's like Johnny picks up the pencil, the pencil is now a prop. If Johnny did not pick up the pencil, but the pencil is on the desk, and no one ever touches it, it's actually a set fixture. Very strange, but there's, very re there's a lot of reasons why this delineation is done. It's so that the division of labor is as easy as, to understand as possible. You don't want the set department to misunderstand like, you know, who's supposed to bring the pencil, and then you know, the pencil doesn't end up being there or something like that. Um, so for example, here's a great example. If I had a uh, gun, like a real gun, like a proper you know, whatever, if I have a real gun and I affix it to a desk and no character will ever touch that thing, that is now a set object. It's like literally part of the set. So that's how things get delineated uh, on sets. And that happens all the time. So a prop gun can be any gun, real or fake, which is kind of the annoying thing, is like, you know, again, this is slang terms that we're dealing with. You might have a prop gun that's not actually a functioning firing gun, but you call it a prop gun because it is a, it's standing in for a gun and it's a prop, right? So it's confusing. If it's supposed to be a toy gun in the script, right, you would call it like a prop toy gun. That's, you know, that's, that's what you would call it. The second thing is that there are many types of prop guns. So be ready uh, for the many different kinds of prop guns and what they do. So I'm going to start from like the least... I guess, dangerous to the most dangerous. So the least dangerous is a rubber gun. Like it's literally just a silicon like uh, mold of a gun. And they're used a lot for a lot of hand to hand combat stuff. So think about like a action movie where like people are like pistol whipping each other and like, you know, whatever. Uh, or you have like scenes where like is that mixed in with like really rapid firing and stuff like that? You might use a rubber gun so that no one accidentally gets whacked in the head with a uh, with a piece of plastic or metal. None of which would be fun, <laughs> fun to get hit in the head with. Uh, so yeah, you might use a rubber gun for that. There are plastic guns. So this is a gun molded out of plastic, and these don't, are don't fire. They may or may not have moving parts at all. And as far as I can tell, they're mostly used for kids. Like if there's a scene where there's a kid that has to fire a gun or something like that. And now that I think about it, when I was doing research for this, I noticed that I, I remember remembering scenes where kids shoot guns. And I, I think they're all CG invariably, which makes a lot of sense. But yes, so they use a plastic gun. If you've never held a gun, guns can be quite heavy. It can be quite taxing for a, even a pistol is actually a lot heavier than you think. So it can be quite tasking. Tax, taxing for a child to uh, constantly hold up or something like that. So yes, there are plastic guns. There are airsoft guns. So they sometimes use airsoft guns. Airsoft is a sport where you shoot uh, pellets. Now, I'm not sure in the list that I was looking at whether they're confusing airsoft gun with like a ga gas blowback replica. I'll explain in a moment, but I'm not actually sure why you would ever use an airsoft gun, given that shooting pellets would never be useful nor advisable on on a set. Um, I mean, you could hit someone in the eye or something like that. I mean, it, it can also be quite dangerous. Um, when you play airsoft, you're, you have a lot of gear on usually. Yes, then there are replica guns. So these are non-functional, but they're solid metal. They may or may not be full fidelity, right? So they, they may or may not actually have moving parts or be exactly to the spec of the real, we real weapon. Uh, it may have a plug in the front, a metal plug, 
or you may not be able to load it or something like that, but it's a full on replica, it, but it, it doesn't work. There's no way it can ever fire a bullet. It, it's just a dummy, right? These are used mostly if you're not firing. So if someone's picking up a prop gun from a table, right? And, uh, you know, giving to someone else, whatever the scene is, but they don't intend to fire it, they will use these replica guns instead of anything else, right? So it looks nice and real and metal. Uh, light properties are extremely hard to fake. It's very hard to, unless you mess with something and try to get metal sheen or like scratches on metal, uh, it's very hard to make plastic look like metal and stuff like that. So that's why they use those replica guns instead. Then there's gas blowback. Gas blowback is when you have like a little cylinder of usually what's uh, compressed CO2 and this replica gun essentially uh, maybe looks just like or slightly modified from its real counterpart, but it has a CO2 cartridge on the inside. And when you pull the trigger, it lets out uh, that compressed CO2 gas out of the muzzle. Part of the gas gets chambered, or not chambered. I don't, I'm not very good firearm terms, guys. Uh, that CO2 gas gets cycled back into the slide, thus pushing the slide back uh, to simulate the action of the weapon. So you're actually releasing a gas and the slide gets moved back and forth. Now this motion is just motion, right? So the slide is usually easier to glide on these weapons. It doesn't require as much force for them to glide backwards. So all it's trying to do is give uh, the illusion that the weapon's actually cycling, right? That this actually has motion to it. It does not have any kickback or any other effects like that. You know, it's not going to give you recoil. Um, it there'll does. be some... Hmm? I was looking it up, right? Because so, I was thinking, I was like, I'm pretty sure gas blowback is a type of airsoft gun, right? Yes. Um, I looked it up and it says that of all airsoft replicas, gas blowback guns tend to be lighter. The term blowback comes from the enhanced recoil of these guns. Yes, yes. So you get a feedback, you get physical feedback, but it's mostly the, as far as I've understood, and I think like a long time ago, maybe when I was in high school, uh, a friend of mine uh, gave me his uh, airsoft gas, uh, gas blowback uh, um, semi-auto pistol to shoot. And uh, I remember feeling the recoil, but it's not anything like shooting a gun. It's more like... You get the so like some um, uh, some some like rumble motors, some controller rumble motors. <laughs> yeah, it, it's a little bit more specific than that. It like gets the direction of motion yeah, yeah, correct, yeah. but like, but it's like <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's just like it, like it gives you like um yeah, it's like the same thing as rumble motor where it's like you're not supposed to actually feel like you're shooting a gun, like actually, you know, it's just something. <laughs> right, exactly, that. exactly. You get the momentum of the of the slide moving back, right? Is like what like ends up putting applying the force to you. Maybe a little bit of the gas pressure, but I highly doubt it as there's nothing plugging the uh the the muzzle or anything like that. Yes, and I think there are gas blowback replicas that are not airsoft guns. I think I think that might be the case that are may just be designed for representing their real counterparts. Okay, we're not done yet. <laughs> there are things called non-guns, which is a film-specific term for guns that have an explosive or a replica that has an explosive on the inside of the gun. So it's, there's something called a squib, which is very common in film. Squibs are, squibs are really small explosive packets. You might use them for blood bursts and stuff like that, you know, uh, where someone gets shot. Or you might use them uh, in Saving Private Ryan, all the dust up uh, coming up on the D-Day scene of the machine gun fire hitting, hitting the sand. All of that's practical. None of that's VFX. And so what they did was they planted a tiny explosive for every one of those bullet uh, uh, you know, landings in the sand uh, the day before. They spent all night doing it. And so what you're seeing when you're seeing that scene of the bullets hitting the sand is actually these tiny explosives going off, shooting the sand up. They're extremely directional, which I think is where the safety comes from, right? So you can attach it to someone's body. Um, it, the force gets applied directionally outward. Um, so it doesn't really apply much force to you, right? So it uh, can be done pretty safely. So what they do is they put one of those squibs inside of the muzzle of a gun designed for this particular use case, and the trigger is electrically connected to the squib. And when you pull the trigger, it fires the explosive off, and you get an effect. Now, the problem with these when, is that nothing actually actuates, right? So, like... In none of these designs do like does like the cylinder on a revolver rotate or like the the uh, slide on a pistol actually move, which makes them apparently not used terribly often is what I understand. 
And the last thing is an actual firearm that you're using as a prop, right? And this is a firearm with what's called blanks, which I will expl explain in a moment. But they're universally applicable, right? You can use them in all scenarios that are safe, right? Um, they're not like literally safe. I'll explain that in a moment. But uh, you can you can use them in pretty much every situation because you're using the real gun. You get a good amount of force feedback, and you get all the uh, effects happening live time. And yes, that's exactly what it is. You get more realistic recoil. The actor reacts to what they're doing a lot more realistically. The problem is is that they're a lot more expensive. You need a lot of planning, and it requires a lot of safety measures to be put in place. Those are the, the cons as to why you might not use them for literally every scene, um, you know, where you might be shooting at a distance. Okay. So on the set of Rust, they had several of these guns, as you would expect, because you want to use the safest thing possible or the least, I mean, think about it just from the AD's perspective or the, the you know, the getting a move on on things perspective. You want to get things done as quickly as possible. So if you can cut out the safety steps and use a plastic gun or a rubber gun instead, you're going to do that, right? So they have all these kinds of guns on set. Um, not all these kinds of guns, literally. I don't know how many of them they did. They at least had three of these types of guns on set. Now, there's the gun that Alec uh, Baldwin was using in this particular scene is called a uh, long 45 Colt. So I have a picture of it right here. So this is a long 45 Colt. If you're listening to audio only, um, you know, you can, you can Google it. But basically, it's like a typical cowboy gun. You know, if you hear anyone talk about this gun, they usually talk about, you know, the Wild West. It's a common gun in Western movies. As you can see, you can probably it probably gives you that feeling instantly when you look at it. And it's a very it's a weapon with a very interesting history that I won't bore you with. Um, but it's a long 45 Colt. Now, that's what it's replicating, but it's not actually a long 45 Colt. What it actually is, is a gun made by, I believe, I think in the name of the firearm manufacturer is Pieti. It's an Italian company. The reason why Pieti makes these uh, long 45 Colts, uh, these long Colt 45s, is that they uh, don't make them anymore, right? Colt doesn't manufacture these anymore, as far as I understand. So a different company makes these replicas. Now, there's an important difference for this to all make sense is that Pieti actually attaches an extra safety to the long 45. And I'll, uh, or it's Pieta, I found the name, Pieta, that's what it is. And I'll explain that in a moment because it won't make sense until I explain how this particular weapon actually operates. So this particular weapon is what's called a single action revolver. So it's a revolver because that thing, you see that, uh, that cylinder looking thing that's not the barrel that would rotate if you fired the uh the particular uh uh rounds that is that's called a cylinder and uh that uh it makes it a revolver essentially i'm really oversimplifying it so that people who don't know anything you know can understand for sure <laughs> that particular thing on a modern revolver would rotate automatically what that means is when i pull the trigger the cylinder would rotate to the next bullet, like in the next uh, live round, if it, if it still has rounds left, upon releasing the trigger, right? So I pull, it fires. Upon releasing, the cylinder rotates to the next position so that when you pull the trigger again, it will fire again, right? I think so you might be slightly off. I could be wrong. I'm also no gun expert, right? But what you're describing, I think, is a double action revolver, right? Yes, that is double action. Did I confuse that? And I believe that? how those work is as you pull the trigger, it uh, resets where the hammer was. Yes. And when you pull it, it does that as further. well. Okay, so not, so not upon releasing does it move. It's as you're pulling, it moves. You know what I'm saying? No, no. So what? It, it's both. So when you pull the trigger, it, yeah. so I'll explain what a hammer is first. That was my next thing. So the hammer, <laughs> you know, in the movies when they're like, I'm going to kill you, and they go first, that thing is called the hammer. Usually when they do that, it's completely unnecessary. Like, there's no reason to pull back the hammer unless you're trying to ensure uh, a lighter trigger or something like that. But it's, it's kind of just a movie thing uh, for modern pistols. But on this particular pistol, you have to pull the hammer. So let me explain. So on a double action revolver, 
you when you pull the trigger, it doesn't matter whether the hammer is pulled back or not. It will uh, the the trigger pull itself will pull the hammer back and it'll come back and hit the bullet. Yeah, that's and what the bullet will go yeah. flying. Yes, you're right. But when you release the triggers, then the cylinder cycles. It's not important for this. Uh, this. Uh, oh yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So that's that's how that functions. Now, a single action means that those two things don't happen with the trigger. The trigger only one controls one action. It only controls the release of the hammer. It doesn't even reset the hammer. It doesn't move this. Uh, I believe. I believe it doesn't even move the cylinder upon release. All it I does. The, is, I think moving the hammer moves the cylinder. Right? right. Exactly. Exactly. So when I pull the trigger, a bullet comes out. The hammer goes down, but it doesn't come back up if I hit the pull the trigger again. I have to manually cock it back, which is what you commonly see in those Western movies. Is they constantly go. Ka-ch, poo, ka-ch, Right, they do that over and over again because that's how this uh, particular uh, revolver functions. It's single action. There's a reason I explained that. I promise. <laughs> the old uh, version of this weapon actually did not fire or had a problem with miss, not misfiring. That's a particular term that I'm going to come to later. But it would fire accidentally sometimes. The reason why it would fire accidentally sometimes is that the hammer even though it wasn't cocked back, might jiggle just enough to strike the, the round and uh, send the bullet flying. It wasn't that common, but it was common enough to be a concern for the army. So, you know, that's a whole history thing that I'm not going into. But the reason why that's important for here is that Pieta, the new manufacturer of this firearm, modified it so that it would no longer have that problem. I won't explain the mechanism, but essentially you have to, there's an actual safety now. Right before the natural safety was that you have to pull back the hammer. Right, that was the natural safety. It would not fire, or it's not intended to fire without pulling back the hammer. But the new version safety has a separate safety that you have to push. Uh, it's technically push in, and uh, then that issue goes away. So a lot of people are saying, "Oh, this weapon had issues." Well, the version that they were using, according to the police department. Uh, was actually the Pieta version of the firearm that I'm not sure if they modified or not. I have no information about that. So here, I have a 3D printed, here it is. I printed this 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 morning. A 3D printed representation of a 45 round. I don't think Anybody this is actually- audio only does not know what's happening. <laughs> <laughs> right, exactly. So again, look these things up. So if you want to know what a 45 round looks like, it looks kind of like this. Um, I printed in gold PLA, which is looking like it might not show up well on camera. But basically, a bullet has three parts. It has the top part here, the round part, that is the, what is actually the bullet, right? So we commonly refer to this whole thing as a bullet, but that top round part is the actual bullet. The bottom part here, uh, between, uh, it's so hard to see, I apologize, but between the bullet and this bottom bit that looks a little bit disconnected that's called the cartridge and that holds the gunpowder right that actually propels the bullet out of the gun so it has the i don't think it's technically an explosive it's it's because i think it, it technically ignites it doesn't explode um but it has the propellant on the inside of it the back of the bullet has what's gunpowder. called yeah yeah gunpowder mm-hmm. the back of it has what's called a primer this is what actually lights the Uh, propellant on the inside of the cartridge. This uh, primer gets struck by the hammer that we're talking about, which sets the bullet off. Now, generally speaking, these bullets are considered to be relatively inert if they're, if they're, uh, you know, stored properly, if you don't store them in heat or something like that. But like when you're handling bullets, it's not a big deal, right? If you see someone like moving bullets around, they're not like, like scared that the bullet might randomly go off. That's not a thing. These things are, you know, pretty inert. You know, you really need to cook them, like, you know, have a fire or something. Allies, at least, or at least in this, in, 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 in those areas. Because I'm pretty sure there was a time where uh, they were actually kind of sketch. <laughs> These bullets? I, I don't even think. Recall, yeah. I think it was um, maybe, was it World War One factories where you couldn't, like, just be tossing around bullets or something like that? You have to actually, like, be careful with them. Maybe, maybe. Yeah, I'm not sure. Not, I'm not the biggest uh, munitions history person or anything like that. So... Those are those things. Now, a blank, the reason I tell you the parts of a, of a round is that a blank is this minus the bullet 
So take off the bullet and just leave the cartridge and the primer and you've essentially got a blank. Now, usually they also take out a little bit of gunpowder so that it doesn't kick as hard, right? As a as it normally would. But uh yeah, but you don't have to do that for that to be a blank. You know, this is a what the military does is they essentially take uh well they they manufacture them specifically for the military these days. But essentially you can take this bullet off of the round and you'll have a blank. And usually what they put on front is either like a little bit of wadding or or just like in some cases just a little piece of cardboard just so the contents don't fall out when you're loading it or anything like that. So that's what a blank is. Now, you still get recoil, but it's going to be a little bit less. Part of that's because for safety concerns. And it's hard to describe if you've never fired a firearm before. But when you shoot off a round, it feels like you're literally trying to contain an explosion. It is a very, like, like visceral experience when you fire a gun, especially if it's your first time doing so, and especially if you're shooting anything bigger than nine millimeter or, you know, even nine millimeter, if you're not expecting it, you know, it might be a little kick a little harder than you, you might think, but this is a big gun. It, it, it's hard to, I'll show you in a moment, but this is a big gun. For, um, for, uh, for a reference, what do you say? It's 45 caliber, right? That means, uh, what, like 0.45 inches in diameter or something like that? I believe so. Which yeah. is pretty, that's, that's pretty thick <laughs> as far as bullets go. Yes. Yeah, like this, that nine millimeter before as, you know, being the edge of, you know, uh, large, I guess. Yeah, exactly. Um, they're also extremely loud. They produce smoke and flash, very similar to the, the uh, actual firearm. And it, it's very hard to under, under say how loud a, a gun is. They are loud like they're loud when i you know went to the range with my mufflers on and uh earplugs on which you know i don't i think that i don't think many people actually double protect their ears but i was uh paranoid so i, I did that and uh still they're very loud even through uh that much uh reduction of uh sound so extraordinarily loud objects and troops and training will use these things and they can be made by hand with simple machinery. So, like, you literally can just buy, like, this, uh, m- you know, simple mechanical machine that you put the bullet in and you pull the lever and it, like, literally, like, pulls the, pops the bullet off of the uh, cartridge. And then you can crimp, you know, fold, like, the, the ragged ed- edges so that it's not so ragged anymore and then cover it up yourself. So you can make blanks on your own. Okay. The last terms are is the word are the words cold, hot, and live. The media does not understand these words apparently. At least I'm going to explain them what they mean in a firearms context. I assume that's what they also mean on a set, although I may be wrong about that. And I I just I can't imagine you conflating these terms on a set and switching them around or something like that. That just sounds like a recipe for disaster. So, cold, hot, and live. A cold gun is an empty gun. I mean, there's no, there's nothing in it. Like not even, you know, not even blanks, right? There's literally nothing in the gun. A cold gun is an empty gun. A hot gun is a, a, this is something you mostly use on a film set. Um, A hot gun is a gun loaded with blanks or something that will actually go off, right? That's not the same thing though as a live gun. A live gun is something that has live ammunition in it, meaning this whole thing. A hot gun would be a gun with blanks inside. So I see a lot of articles not understanding that what cold meant. A lot of people think that cold means that it didn't have live munitions in it. No, it means it has nothing in it, zero. Um, And that'll be very important, very important. Why does Hollywood use blanks? Well, I've got a video that my friend took of me shooting a uh, 45 uh, modern pistol. Um, I think this one's me shooting a Glock. I'm not 100 percent sure. Um, for the first time, like these are some of my first shots. So my form is terrible. Don't judge me. My form is still terrible, to be honest. Um, don't judge me. And I probably received the recoil uh, a lot more wimpish than uh, people who are used to these things. So. <laughs> Uh, here, but here's here's me firing for the first time. Um, let me rewind that real quick. This one's in slow motion, so you can see that the 
force essentially causes my arm to involuntarily jerk in a very particular manner that I could not naturally produce. In fact, I know this uh, from years back because I've, I came up in VFX. That's how I started in film. And one of the first things you learn is how to do gunfire, like fake gunfire and stuff like that, because it's so common. And no matter how hard you ask your actors to jerk themselves or to jerk themselves in particular ways, it never looks right. The reason and what you'll end up doing is you'll end up cutting out a frame to try to make it jump in a more lively fashion. So you literally skip a bit of time so that it looks like the weapon goes up faster, right? Than it uh, normally does. But it's still, the body mechanics still don't look quite right. Here, I'll show you one real time of me shooting a 45 a few times. So I'm lining up. <laughs> there it is. And you can see me, uh, you know, I'm still getting used to it. Of like surprised by my own uh <laughs> by what's happening um but it's quite a visceral experience so there you can you can see it so that's one of the reasons they use uh live rounds and i think probably the most compelling reason to use live rounds although i will say that the other the other not live rounds sorry Whew. let me clarify real quick blanks not live rounds you don't lose use live rounds on sets which will come in in play in a moment but while you use blanks is for that particular reason. More importantly is you'll use blank, or not more importantly, other reasons you might use blanks are for volumetric and active smoke, right? Especially on older firearms. So, you know, you can do smoke CGI, but if you're going to be shooting like hundreds of rounds in a film and you want them to look like they're interacting with the environment, the wind, uh, act, uh, interacting in 3D, then you might uh, do it for that real, uh, real uh, that reason as well. Now, I again, I really know nothing about this stuff, but I I read some comments from people who appear to know quite a bit more about firearms than than I do, which is nothing. Uh, commenting that that's not even like even doing thinking about smoke isn't realistic because the kind of gun that is used on, on this film and any kind of Western film. Right, they would have used black powder instead of white powder, which would have produced a lot thicker smoke. And it's not feasible to film with that smoke. So even though we're already losing realism by not using the historically accurate powder. So yeah, that, is that, that really is that a concern then? That, that you know that that why why is realism less le some degree of lesser realism with smoke important? I can actually think of a movie where there is a lot of smoke, uh, Glory, um, which is a Civil War movie, and there's a lot of smoke uh, when they shoot off, and that, uh, as I said, Civil War, so they were talking about the similar sort of era, but yeah, other than that, yeah, I don't really, I guess I don't, I don't watch olden times gun movies, <laughs> so I, I wouldn't know that, uh, what goes on in other, other ones. Yeah, from from the VFX perspective, I imagine that what you would do is you would essentially uh, gussy up the existing smoke, even if you're using the modern uh, what's called smokeless powder, even though it does smoke a little bit. So what you might want to achieve is achieve the uh, like around the muzzle, get that smoke, that very volumetric, um, you know, reacting with the air, moving around the space as it naturally would, moving around the, the person as it naturally would, you know. When you're doing VFX, a lot of things are very 2D. It's hard to realize if you're watching a movie. Um, that's because they're good at their jobs. But a lot of things are actually 2D. They're not actually like 3D, three-dimensional. So you might want to get that little bit of practical that you then exaggerate with uh, a lot of those 2D assets that you add in, right? That might be one reason. I don't think smoke is like the number one reason. If, if, I, if, I, you know, if I'm just doing it just for the smoke, I don't know if that would be compelling enough. I think it's more for the the recoil and the uh, actors as well, uh, for their uh, for for them to feel it. You know, it's 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 a very visceral feeling when you uh, pull the trigger on on something that explodes in your hand, and so they react as such. And the loudness too. I assume you're going to startle your other actors for reals, right? Um, if they're supposed to be reacting in a scene or something like that. And you also, I mean. Uh, mis miscommon understanding as well that I've seen is that you get the flash. You don't actually get the flash on film. 
The reason why it films 24 frames a second and the chances that you catch the flash in that 24 frames a second is actually pretty low. You probably saw flash in the film that I put up, but that's because uh, someone's cell phone camera is probably filming at like 60 FPS or something like that. So you could actually see the flash. So the flash is almost always added in post. Um, and it's also not for the sound because the sound is almost added always not almost is invariably added in post because you cannot record that loud of a sound uh, in any consistency <laughs> or anything you know realistic. So that's why those are some reasons why you might use live rounds on set. Now, how ubiquitous not live you rounds. My blank. goodness, sorry, hot <laughs> rounds on set. So you might use blanks on set. The reason the reason I, I say this as well is that it's extraordinarily common. Like, it's much more common than you think. In practically every movie that has guns in it, there are scenes with blanks. You know, Alec Baldwin knows this. Everyone on set knows this. It's actually not that uncommon at all. It's extraordinarily common. You know, John Wick, um, Bond films, literally anything, you know. And that's why I think people have become a little bit accustomed to what it looks like because they just assume everything is CG when that's actually not the case. Like, most things are actually practical that way especially if you can do it safely in a scene, you're probably going to want to do it because you have the budget to have all the safety precautions. Speaking of safety precautions, here is what's supposed to happen. And we're going to compare it to what did happen. Um, and it, I think you'll be very, it'll be interesting. So general firearm safety tips. You don't point the gun at something that you're not willing to kill or destroy. This is the first thing that I learned. I learned it, you know, when I first learned about gun safety, I learned it when I got, you know, a little training at the range is you never point the gun, a gun at something you're not willing to kill or destroy. You always assume that if it were to go off, someone will die. These things are not treated lightly, right? The second thing is finger off the trigger unless you're ready to fire. So the movies actually make you think that this is not a thing, but even soldiers will do this, right? So, you know, in movies, you see their fingers always on the trigger and they're like running around with their finger on the trigger. That's extraordinarily dangerous, even for themselves. And it doesn't take much to move your finger outside of the trigger guard so that you don't accidentally pull the trigger and shoot yourself. Right. Um, even if you're in like a panic situation like that, uh, you're going to remove your finger when you're not intending to fire. So never put your finger on the trigger unless you intend to fire. Third thing is always check the status of a weapon before you assume the status of the weapon. Again, I learned this in my training. It's very particular. Like when you go to a range, it's not a joke. Like people, you know, it's a common activity, but it's not a funny act. It's not like people are like being funny, right? Around. Yeah, I've seen, I've seen quite a few videos of like range videos where the people tend to like take it super seriously. I remember one um, dude was shooting something. I think there's some rifle, right? And he like turned a little bit, right, with it in his hand, such that, like, you know how like um in the range, right, in an indoor range, um, you have these sort of dividers between people. If you know what I'm talking about, uh, the left and the right side of people will be like these barriers. Mm -hmm. um, and like once the dude like ah you do, I don't think he you know he was he wasn't really thinking, I guess, right? But he's turning with the weapon in his hand. I think he was going to talk to somebody. Once the gun like pointed in such a way that it passed the divider, like some dude just slammed the gun <laughs> into the into the table. Yeah, no, really? like it's no, like people are really, really, really serious about their gun safety at, you know, these kinds of places. So like people could smell that it was the first time or when I walked in and I was getting like quasi stalked the first time I walked in because people smelled green, right? Which is a good thing, right? You, you want people to be very particular about how they handle something that's, you know, in most cases literally meant to kill things, right? So, you know, you, you got to be careful. And on a revolver here, I've actually printed the entire cylinder of a revolver. It's actually the exact Colt 45 cylinder that uh, Alex Baldwin, Alec Baldwin had. Uh, this is the cylinder part of that Colt 45 that we were talking about earlier. And so you see on the inside here, I've got a few rounds. Here's the one I was using as an example. Oh, right here that you can put into one of those slots right there to load the weapon and this thing turns as you uh, cock the hammer so that you cycle to new bullets, allowing you to hold six bullets in the gun at one time. Now, 
I don't have the whole thing printed and I couldn't find a model of the whole thing anyway. Um, but the thing that, that's, that people need to appreciate is that this is actually relatively easy to check whether it's hot or cold, never mind live or cold. Easier than a normal firearm because a normal, or sorry, modern um, magazine fed firearm where you pull the magazine out and you can't see the rounds underneath. You can't, in some magazines, you can't see how many weapons you have lo or how many uh, uh, bullets you have uh, left in your magazine. On a revolver, all you have to do is rotate and you can actually see like on the, there's a gap on the side of the gun where you can see the brass protruding just a little bit off to the side. So you can just rotate, 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 rotate until you're confident you've seen all six. And if you see air, then it's empty. If you see brass, then it's not empty. So it's very easy to tell on a revolver whether something is cold or hot. Um, much easier than in a modern on a modern gun. Okay, and the last thing is culture. Gun, like I was mentioning earlier, gun culture is like, I mean, you watch gun YouTubers, they are extremely particular. Even if they're just in a room alone with a camera, the, the culture around these things are so safety oriented that if someone doesn't clear it in front of the camera in the video, the audience will get mad. Like literally you'll see a bunch of comments like, what are you doing? Like you forgot to check, you know, you forgot to check, you forgot to check. That's the general culture around gun safety is extremely particular. And I would hope that that culture is imparted on anyone who's asked to handle a real firearm that could actually kill someone. And the last thing is don't mix live and hot guns. And that will come into play later. I don't want to cause no problems. I just want to live my life, but I keep on hearing about nonsense. Me and my dons ain't mobsters, but you know when you see imposters. We know how to read them faces, same way you know how to read them comments. If you want to talk, let's talk. But around here, make sure you walk and your talk is constant.